The next verse is 613. But there seems to have been some miscounting. There seems to be a couple of mistakes which kind of sort themselves out after verse 662. So there might be a slight discrepancy between my numbering and the numbering of the original Sanskrit. It's to do with the way the verses have been presented by Professor Suzuki. But let's not worry about it. And press on with 614. The statement that a hare has no horns is made out of the reasonings concerning a jar, a garment, a crown and a horn. When there is no complete cause, there is no real existence. Thus you should know. <coughs> so this seems a bit cryptic, but we've actually covered this already. What this is arguing against is the idea that something comes from nothing. And that might not seem particularly relevant, this idea that something comes from nothing, but it's actually the basis of all modern science. And it's also the basis of a great deal of religious understanding, which has its origins in the Middle East, in other words, in the great religious traditions of Judaism, Christianity and Islam. We all believe that at one point there was nothing and that at another point there was something. God created something out of nothing. And if you're a scientist, you can extrapolate back to that point where time and space popped into existence, known as the Big Bang. And before that, there was no time and no space. So we can say the universe began about 13 billion or so years ago. So the idea here is that somehow nothing is the default state. The scientific point of view concurs with that of the Abrahamic religions in the assumption that at some point there's nothing and then there's something. <coughs> Now what we've got here in verse 614 is an argument against this. Unfortunately, it's a rubbish argument. And it was covered, as I mentioned, back in verse 553. Let's have a look at 553 again. A straw mat is not found in cloth, nor cloth in straw, nor cloth in a straw matting. Why is it that by some combination anything is not produced from any other thing? And verse 553. If the eye, form and vijnana were not, and now they are, in other words, at one point there was no such, there was nothing, and now there is. Straw mats, crowns, cloth, etc. would be produced from lumps of clay. <coughs> so it's arguing here that if, if, there was a, if there was at one point nothing and then there's something, why is there not any combination of anything? And the one given here in verse 614 is that of the hair with horns. If something is produced out of nothing, then we could have a hair with horns. Or we could make a, a garment out of a jar, or a crown out of a garment, or a horn out of a crown. And it's saying because you can't do that, then this understanding is false, that something came out of nothing. And that there can be no real existence. So spiritually this is correct. But philosophically, it's quite wrong because the writer doesn't know about evolution. I mean, it could be we could have a hair with horns, but we don't because of that's, that's the way it's evolved. Through the forces that shape species. So evolution shapes what forms are available. And the argument that you can't make a garment from a jar and so on, 
Well, if theoretically you can, you could break things down to their their uh, atomic constituents, their basic elements. You can change one element to another. Uh, you can recombine them. I mean, we could even do some 3D printing. So, it's very shaky ground. The writer's on very shaky ground here. The author's on very shaky ground. Um, and also, the Lankavatara Sutra, its stated intention is to, is to dismantle the net of philosophical views. So, there's a bit of a lapse here. There's a lapse here in the Sagatikam. Because it's descended into philosophical views. And this is quite, this is actually quite reassuring, I find. This text, as far as I'm concerned, is one of the sublime, the most sublime creations of this planet. It's describing enlightenment practice. And one of my points is, enlightenment practice is often about failure. About getting things wrong. I got things wrong a while back. I predicted that the scientists at the Large Hadron Collider in CERN in Switzerland would not find the Higgs boson. It seemed to me obvious that they wouldn't because this Higgs boson gives an explanation for matter. And up to this point, up to the hypothesis of the Higgs boson, scientists couldn't explain why there is such a thing as matter. And now they've got their explanation in the discovery of the Higgs boson. Now it seemed to me they wouldn't find it because matter is a story. Spiritually, there's no such thing as matter. There is resistance. The resistance in the field of experiencing. And we can ascribe that to matter or to the earth element, if we're talking in terms of the traditional elements. The earth element is about solidity, is about impeding movement, impe impeding freedom. So it's a story. So my mistake was applying spiritual understanding to conventional understanding. And the mistake was also assuming that the scientific method, which is one of objectivity, is conducive to truth. The scientific assumption is that subjectivity is false and objectivity is more true. Objectivity is certainly more practical. It's more practical for manipulating the world around us. It's more practical for resolving disputes and so on. But that doesn't make it more real or more true. So science has found something to confirm its own story and that's fine but it's nothing to do with spiritual insight so I had this so I was applying spiritual understanding to conventional reality and you can't do that you can't do that and this is what's happened in this verse here spiritual insight they're trying to justify it in terms of conventional understanding, conventional understanding being philosophical arguments. Spirituality is not about philosophical arguments, it's about direct realisation. And I appreciate there might be all sorts of ob objections to that, but uh, we can maybe address these another time. It's an interesting topic though. And it's probably worth spending a bit of time looking at this on a practical level. I'm in a curious situation. 
as I've mentioned now and again, I'm having tremendous trouble with my body. Um, at times it's very difficult to move it, especially first thing in the morning. And there's just so much pain, discomfort and searing pain. It's It, it localises in different parts of my body. Most recently it's in my neck and shoulders. It makes movement very difficult. My legs don't seem to be operating too well and occasionally my whole nervous system seems inflamed. That um, I can, It's very hard to focus and uh, everything becomes a major effort. And my doctor has started taking my condition seriously. He's, you know, he said to me in no uncertain terms the other day, you are unwell, I am unwell. But his reasons for this are quite different from mine. He's not actually interested in my swelling and in my aches and pains. What he's interested in is certain measurements of my blood. And uh, there are certain factors in my blood which seem to be all over the place. Now it's a curious thing when you're not well. Because this body which you shamble along with all your life, as soon as it's not working, it becomes other people's responsibility. Other people know more about it than you. Even my wife, when I'm ill, she seems to think she knows what's best for my body and my wishes or inclinations become quite irrelevant. It's not a very satisfactory state of affairs, I have to say. It's a curious thing though, isn't it? As soon as you're ill, everybody else seems to become an expert on your own body. I've got my own take on what's going on in my body. For me it's like a psychophysical, for me it's a psychophysical trauma working its way through. And the first thing you might ask is, well what caused it? It doesn't really matter. It's like being in a train crash. You know, but what caused the train crash? It doesn't matter. What you need to do is somehow manage the trauma of being in the train crash. My trauma, I think all the ailments which are afflicting me, I could sum up in the condition known as me. Because every symptom that I'm experiencing seems to be a manifestation of core parts of my psychology, of my personality. It's something very deep and perhaps something very ancient, inherited, depending on your frame of reference, from my parents' DNA or from past lives. It doesn't really matter. So my concern is managing this, managing this trauma and coming through it. But the doctor, you know, he's got other ideas. I'm getting all sorts of tests and none of them have really contradicted my own understanding. At one point he thought I might even have a malignancy and I've been getting all sorts of scans but nothing's showing up. Which is what I expect. I don't think any of these scans are going to show anything. And so far I'm right. But it's curious. Uh, should So my own understanding. I'm sticking with it. But I have to be open to the conventional understanding as well. My own understanding is perhaps... I don't know if I could describe it as spiritual, but it's my own take on things anyway. I like to think I know my own body, but it doesn't come with a manual, so I have to rely on the doctor. So, fair enough, he's taking my situation seriously. The, malign the malignancy has been ruled out. He apologised for that, although I appreciated that he 
was letting me know how he was thinking. He did put the wind at me though. So I, I do actually see it though as a spiritual process because enlightenment practice is about not indulging the moods, about stepping back. So what, what's happening now, perhaps this is because there's been a degree of success in my enlightenment practice. What I'm getting is blowback or something like that. I'm getting some sort of major reaction from my body, my moods, because they're not being fed. They are manifesting directly in the body. This makes so much sense to me. So all I can do is keep practicing and use whatever medications available to help support me because there are times you just need something to help you cope because you cannot practice. Well, you can, you can never rule that out. But we'll see what the uh, scans reveal. I'm going to get a, some kind of, I think something called an isotopic bone scan it might be an infection in the, the bones. So I'm open to that possibility. So when we engage with conventional reality, conventional understanding, we have to do it in its own terms. Let it get on with its thing. And the body is very much part of conventional reality. So it's an interesting exercise in letting go. Letting go the notion of dominion over your own body because it's an illusion both the body and the idea that you've got dominion over it our only concern as enlightenment practitioners is coming back more and more often to the realization of mind only.